give you an idea of what I'm going to try to do here. One of the takeaway points I want you to get from this is we're a very methodologically diverse uh, discipline. And within environmental sociology, we really em we embrace methodological pluralism. And, and I stand by that statement. Like if you hang out with environmental sociologists, a big group of us, we do a lot of different things. You know, we have sort of an underlying common thread that ties us together. We have a lot of love for one another and what we do in a lot of general support. But we use a lot of different kinds of research designs. Uh, using different kinds of techniques, different kinds of data, different scopes. And it's really exciting because there's a lot of support and embracement in this idea of methodological pluralism. And one of the things that I, that I want to emphasize too is, is we, I, I'm approaching this from the point of view of the methodology that you use is a function of your research questions. These are tools, you know, and I'm not going to try to privilege one method over, over another, even though in my own work I primarily use statistical modeling techniques. But the reason for that is primarily been because of the sorts of research questions I've asked, I'd like to think. And so, you know, these are tools and you, depending on what it is that you want to do, you know the analogy, right? You know, you're going to use the right tools depending on what it is that you're trying to build or do. And uh, folks earlier had asked about, you know, hypothesis testing and linking theory with data. And I, and I want to talk, hopefully that's going to come out quite a bit because, you know, a lot of the research that we do is hypothesis testing, de depending on the research question and the methods that we ask. But oftentimes, though, it's more exploratory and inductive and the sort of duality between theory and analysis. This, this distinction between purely deductive versus, versus purely inductive, I think it's nonsense. Okay, I, I don't think that we have purely deductive sociology or purely inductive sociology. We're somewhere on this continuum. And I like to feel like I usually dance somewhere on this continuum with different things. And I think that that's doing good sociology from my point of view. Um, units of analysis, boy, we do everything from the individual, we do autoethnographies, which isn't all that common, but there's something called autoethnographies, but we also do individual level types of analyses all the way up to this global social system and everything in between. You know, it's a, the, the whole social world is open for study, according to sociologists. And so within the context of environmental sociology, from the examples you see, you know, we do do everything from individual level studies of environmental attitudes and behaviors to cross-national longitudinal studies, looking at relationships between militarization and carbon emissions. We look at what predicts whether or not nations are more likely to ratify environmental treaties or not. Um, what it, why is it that some folks embrace this notion of climate change denial that we've talked about? And, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But also, at the same time, using um, uh, different methods uh, that allow you to look at multiple units of analysis simultaneously is something I want to talk about, too. Uh, primary and secondary data, you know, depending on, again, your research question and depending on then what uh, methods you're going to use, um, you're, you might spend some time doing primary data collection. How many of you have done primary data collection? I tip my hat to all of you. It's so incredibly time, it takes a lot of time, doesn't it, to, to do well. Uh, the majority of the work that I've done has been secondary data analysis. Now, sometimes secondary data anal analysis isn't as time consuming. Sometimes it is, depending on where you're obtaining your data from and what you're using it for. But environmental sociologists use both primary and secondary data and sometimes a, a mix of the two. And something else that I think is unique, well, it's not unique to I think anyone in here, but for environmental sociologists relative to the discipline, and this is something that Riley is going to talk a lot about later uh, today and then, and then Dana will, will talk about as well. If you sort of look at the history of environmental sociology relative to the discipline, it's pretty unique. It's become increasingly less unique, but it's still pretty unique, the idea relative to other sociologists that we combine both social data and ecological and environmental data. And we also treat the environment, whether it's the built environment, the natural environment, or some, somewhere in between, as a dependent variable or an independent variable, and sometimes both. And that's something that distinguishes us from the discipline more broadly, even though I'd like to think that we become more central to the discipline. And I, and I think that we are becoming more central to the discipline. So ethnography um, is a big, I, I had a really hard time trying to define what, what ethnography is. And so those of you that are my colleagues in here that are ethnographers, feel free to help me out if I, if I stumble a little bit. Because ethnography is a multi, it's not something that just sociologists do. You know, it's a big multidisciplinary method. I think that most folks out there, if they're, you know, might, are likely to attribute ethnography to cultural anthropological kinds of studies but it's a very um, common 
research methodology in a lot of areas within the, the discipline of sociology, and environmental sociology is certainly one of them. And this is my sort of definition I'm using. Take it or leave it. Um, it's there. But if we think about the different components of ethnography, I think this is one of the things that is, like, I think, important to keep in mind that ethnography is really kind of a suite of different things. And not every ethnography uses the same combination of, of tools, right? It's sort of, it's like ethnography is a small toolbox within the larger toolbox of research methods. That's sort of the analogy I'm using now, at least for today. And so you might have someone that's doing an, doing an ethnographic study that does a great deal of participant observation, but that doesn't do so much of formal interviews or someone that spends a lot of time collecting images, which I think is really neat. Someone earlier brought up photo voice and using more types of, of images in sociological work. And it seems like that's something that we're seeing more and more in ethnographic work. Something else that, I've, that I think is really exciting that I've learned about in terms of where um, ethnographies tend to really focus on one particular you know, kind of case and topic and you know, the, the rich sort of detail and the in-depth kind of analysis you can do. It's just absolutely incredible when you read a strong ethnography to think about how much time and energy went into it. Um, a, a, a new, a relatively newer type of ethnography that's being done within sociology and our sister disciplines is this, this process of relational ethnography that I've been learning about, which is really interesting to me. It's sort of a kind of a comparative type of uh, ethnographic exercise where you might be doing an ethnography on a same general topic but in different sorts of locales and allows you to do some sorts of comparisons. And it seems like it's something that's really kind of new and um, kind of pathbreaking. And I see that as sort of where ethno one stream where ethnography is going to continue to evolve. And some of you in this room have done what I consider to be relational ethnography. Um, one example of, I think, that a lot of us know about the sociology, well, now you're all going to know about it, I think, of, uh, I think, a widely celebrated um, uh, ethnography done by one of us, an environmental sociologist that's gotten a lot of academic praise and gotten a lot of, um, uh, a lot of interest in, in the popular press is an ethnography that, that Carrie Norgard uh, did on climate denial in Norway, where she spent uh, about a year living in a small town in Norway and conducted this r rather incredible uh, ethnographic analysis of climate denial and emotions. And I highly recommend this. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, I use this as a, a great example of how to do strong, strong ethnography. So case studies. So uh, you, you all overheard Riley nudge, uh, kind of teasing me because he, he, he made sure that I, that I mentioned that my advisor was Chris J. Stun. And so I talked about him in the theory thing. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because um, case, a, a lot of research within sociology is often critiqued of being presentist. Now, at the same time, we've done a lot of incredible historical work, including the work done by some of my colleagues in this, in this room doing historical case studies or comparative historical case studies. So you can have historical case studies or more contemporary case studies that tend to be rather in-depth, focusing on a particular case. Again, they're multi-method. Oftentimes, there's a lot of archival research that's done, as well as the analysis of primary and secondary data analysis. There might be some field work that's involved. Um, this work intimidates the heck out of me when I read someone that's done a really strong historical analysis, because you look at the amount of effort and energy that's involved in that kind of rich analysis and being able to keep track of all of those important details. It's, it's really quite incredible. Uh, two examples of, of, well, one contemporary and one historical that I bring up, and I thought they'd be of interest to, to all of you. Uh, so Brian Garreau uh, has done a really interesting contemporary case study on the Montreal Protocol. Now, he's focused this in, on, he's done this by focusing on strawberry, um, strawberry production, and really methyl bromide. Is it methyl bromide? Bromide. Bromide, Brom bromide. okay. In, in California. And this is a contemporary case study. It's very in-depth and it's a way, it's sort of a lens through trying to understand how environmental governance does and does not work in the context of the Montreal Protocol by focusing on this particular case in this particular locale. And it's really more of a contemporary case study. It came out a few years ago. I highly recommend it. He's also my colleague at Boston College, but that's not why I'm bringing this up. It's a very good book. 
Now, another book, though, that I wanted to bring up that just came out that is a very deep historical analysis of a big sort of a, ver a global sort, sort of topic is this study, that, a collaborative study. That's the other reason I wanted to bring it up, a collaborative historical analysis, The Tragedy of the Commodity, Oceans, Fisheries, and Aquaculture. And this is done by three sociologists. It's a great story. They went to graduate school together. They all have very unique backgrounds. Uh, Stefano is from Sicily, and he grew up um, hanging out in fisheries, uh, fishing villages in Sicily. Um, Rebecca spent time on fishing boats in Alaska. And Brett grew up in North Dakota. I think he did fly fishing when he was younger. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, they're all trained in the historical sociology tradition. And so this is a deep historical analysis of really the crisis of the global fisheries that has evolved historically throughout time. It just came out in 2015, Rutgers University Press. Highly recommend this book. It's a, a really interesting example of a deep historical analysis of a socio-environmental topic done by sociologists. So I'm going to move on and talk about some statistical analysis techniques that are typically used for hypothesis testing. And so I am beginning from the point of view, I'm going to assume that for a minute that none of you know what regression analysis is. And I realize most of you, if not all of you, do. But I'm going to start at the very basics and then jump into some particulars. And so, you know, regression analysis, you, you kind of learn the basics of this when you took algebra, if you took algebra in sixth or seventh or eighth grade. You remember that y equals a plus bx thing that gave us a lot of nightmares? It gave me nightmares. <laughs> Ironically, it gave me nightmares because it's pretty much what I use in all of my research or regression analysis techniques. But so these are methods of explaining or predicting the variability of a dependent variable using information about one or more independent variables. And we tend to do multivariate regression analyses, so we have multiple independent variables. And this gets very tricky very quickly. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about some different kinds of regression analysis techniques that largely depend on your, 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 how, what your dependent variable is, how it's measured. Uh, but before I do that, I want to talk about two a couple of distinctions I think are really important. The first is cross-sectional versus longitudinal analyses. Now, within environmental sociology, there's been a shift from viewing more cross-sectional research to more longitudinal research uh, on a lot of socio-environmental topics. This is largely due to the increasing availability of data that allows us to use longitudinal analysis techniques. I'm going to talk more in depth tomorrow about longitudinal analysis techniques uh, and a lot of their sorts of specifics. I'll leave it at that. But if you think about it, though, a cross-section is like a snapshot, right, where you have data for an independent, independent variables and dependent variables, like at one time point. It's like taking a picture, right? And so, OK, this is the analogy I use in my undergraduate stats classes. So if I'm dancing and someone takes a picture of me, I might lo look like a great dancer, right? And it's a snapshot. But if someone films me dancing, <laughs> I'm not a great dancer. So things look very different if you're taking a snapshot versus looking at how things unfold over even a short period of time. It's a good analogy. It really works. It, it works. And for undergrad social stats, it works really well to get this point across. OK. So when we do cross-sectional analyses, we're really trying to understand this idea of variation between cases. right? When we do longitudinal analyses, we're able to analyze variation between cases as well as variation within cases through time. Most of us would think that if we're trying to get at this notion of causality, which is tricky, and we debate this in sociology if we can really do causal analysis or not, many would argue that since we're not using experimental methods, or most of the time we're not using experimental methods, that using longitudinal analysis techniques allow us to more closely approximate, closely approximate experimental conditions and perhaps get at this notion of causality, not purely, but somewhere get closer to it versus doing cross-sectional analysis. Okay. Multi-level analysis. This is something that's becoming increasingly common. You'll hear probably quite a bit about this from Riley later when he talks about how multi-level analysis has been applied to a lot of environmental concern work that Riley has contributed to uh, greatly. But, and I'll talk about this some more tomorrow, but the idea that we have nested levels of analysis, we've already talked about this in, in our theory discussions. But this really, you know, the, the common uh, way of describing this is uh, if you're talking about educational studies, you have students nested within a classroom, nested within a school, nested within a school district, right? 
And if you're trying to understand a student level outcome, you might want to take into account student level characteristics as well as classroom level characteristics, school level char char characteristics, and so on. The idea that context matters, from my point of view, that's what sociology is. Context matters. This allows us to get at multiple levels of context using different measurement, measurements and, and research designs that I'll talk about. And then there's this notion of path analysis, this, this method of path analysis, or a fancier version of it, structural equation modeling. And path analysis and these sorts of methods like SCM, the idea that, surprise, surprise, the things that we study, they're complicated. There's a lot of direct and indirect kinds of relationships. And path analysis and structural equation modeling allows us to look at direct and indirect types of relationships. And you're going to see some applied examples of these different, different sorts of things. So, so hopefully it will become a little bit clearer. OK, so different kinds of regression techniques. So the one that most folks are probably familiar with, whether you like it or not, is that linear regression model that you learned in seventh grade, or if you're me, eighth or ninth grade, when you took algebra and you learned about linear regression. Now, we also have you know, a whole suite of regression uh, models uh, with all sorts of specialized versions of them that are largely a function of how the outcome is measured. And you know, sociology, if you haven't noticed, we're a very diverse discipline, and we study all sorts of things as dependent variables that might be uh, appropriate for a linear regression, or we might have things that we study where a dependent variable is binary. It's dichotomous, a yes-no question. Um, I mean to sound harsh, but are you alive or are you dead? It's kind of <laughs> generally a yes-no sort of thing. Has a nation signed a treaty? Yes or no, right? Yes, no, zero, one. OK, a binary kind of outcome. We, we study a lot of those. Uh, categorical outcomes, where we have more than two categories, but they're qualitative differences. They're things that you can't rank order, or you shouldn't rank order, because they really can't be rank ordered. So you might be studying um, something as an outcome uh, that, what would be a good example of, of a dependent variable in contemporary environmental sociology using multinomial logistic regression? Or my sociology friends help me. We have more than two categories. Migration? How so? So no migration, internal migration, and national migration. Yeah, and you can't rank order. They're different categories, right? They're qualitatively distinct categories, and there's more than two. So you need to use this thing called multinomial logistic regression, which is a more sophisticated version of logistic regression. And it, have any of you used multinomial? I notice not a lot of smile, smiles when you raised your hand. <laughs> Because it's, it's a method where it's sort of, it get, the, the more categories you have for your dependent variable, what happens? It gets more and more clunky and complicated, right? Sort of the, the idea of trying to balance being inclusive enough versus you know, keeping your models relatively simple, right? I mean, this is something that applies to all these methods, but I think it really applies to that one for sure. And then trying to, as a researcher, decide when is it OK to collapse down into three categories versus six or seven? Have any of you had those kinds of challenges? Yeah, OK. Ordinal regression, where we have things that can be rank ordered um, that are different from things that apply in linear regression. Uh, a, a, an obvious example of this would be in attitudinal research on a scale of 1 to 5, on a scale of 1 to 10. Historically, a lot of uh, research had been done in the past on ordinal outcomes using linear models when, in fact, you should have used ordinal regression instead. I think it's mainly a function of a lack of access to um, statistical um, software programs that allowed you to do it. It's become more accessible. The nice thing is, is because of technology, these methods, well, it's a good thing, but also we have to be careful with this. These methods are so much more accessible to use now, even the more sophisticated ones, where you don't really need to know a lot about the underlying assumptions of these fancy models to run a fancy model in Stata or R or whatever your application is. and that. I think, you know, has led to, unfortunately, a lot of n problematic research being done, right, where we can learn some fancy methods without knowing all of the underlying assumptions. Um, Poisson and negative binomial regression are used to thing, study things that can be counted, and you're going to see some examples of this. And then event history, this is one that's interesting. It has all sorts of, um, ex uh, of, of labels, and I think it, it's partly tied to, it seems, what field you're in, right? Like, so um, public health folks call this survival analysis, right? Yeah and, yeah, and political scientists like to call it event history analysis. What um, Cox regression, I don't know, somewhere in between, I guess. 
What I think is interesting is, because this is when you study something like non-repeatable events, and I already used the examples of um, how long does it take for you to die? And then you're dead. And so this is used a lot in mortality types of studies, right? But it's also used to study treaty ratifications. Two very different kinds of questions, right? <laughs> On different sorts of things, perhaps. <laughs> What's interesting, and I've seen this happen, I've been in a room where I've had a political sociologist and a medical sociologist try to talk to one another about how they employ this similar methodology on these two very different questions. And it takes a while for them to realize what the other one is doing and why it's OK. But it just really, I think, illustrates the, how diverse our discipline is, for sure. There's a very interesting fly on the wall experience to see that happen. OK, so now I do have some things like this to talk about some applied examples. And what I did is I just went through um, the environmental sociology literature and tried to pick out some different kinds, slices of some different studies that employ some of these different methods on some different kinds of topics at different units of analysis. So this is from a study published in the American Sociological Review back in 2010 by Don Grant et al. And most of these are collaborative studies too that, that, I'll, that I'll talk about. So these are just baseline cross-sectional linear models looking at uh, chemical plant emissions. So the unit of analysis here are US chemical plants using data from the EPA. You're probably familiar with these data. You're probably very familiar with this, this study. And so, the, and this is in the environmental justice tradition, which is a very large multidisciplinary tradition that environmental sociology has contributed to. And so the unit of analysis here are uh, chemical plants. And the, some of the questions involved in this study, that was multi-method, so I'm going to come back to this later because it uses another interesting methodology, is to ask some sort of fundamental sort of environmental justice questions about sort of the, diver the ethnic diversity of surrounding neighborhoods. You know, are, are um, minority populations disproportionately uh, you know, represented in nearby areas to chemical plants? And the short answer is yes, uh, according to this type of analysis. Is it tied to income, medium house in income? According to this analysis, not so much. It appears to really be uh, about, about racial and ethnic inequality. And, um, and, I, and I want to use this as an example because I think that those that are not really familiar with the environmental justice literature think that it's kind of an activist-oriented area of literature that doesn't have a lot of um, methodological rigor to it. There's actually a lot of methodologically rigorous studies using different kinds of research design studying environmental justice types of topics. Okay, so now going from that to the very global, um, this is an analysis, a collaborative analysis that, that I've done with an economist, Juliet Shore, and a couple of our graduate students looking at the relationship between domestic income inequality within nations and national level of carbon emissions for uh, wealthy nations, middle income nations, and poor nations, and asking, is there an association and does it change through time? Yes and yes. <laughs> and here's an example of why it might be appropriate to look at things longitudinally because if you didn't look at this longitudinally, in fact, you'd have a lot of what we call null findings, a lot of non-significant effects in this type of analysis. It would suggest that there doesn't appear to be an empirical relationship between these two things that some of us are interested uh, in studying. And this is the result of one of those tables that I had up before with a lot of um, independent variables and control variables. And this is a two-way fixed effects model. I'll talk about these more tomorrow. OK, so now we've talked about plants. We've talked about nation states. Let's talk about individuals embedded within nation states. So here's a table from a multi-level logistic regression analysis of environmental concern. It's an individual le level analysis of 48,000 individuals <laughs> nested within 37 nations. It's a lot to say. <laughs> And this is an interesting example of folks within this tradition of research that Riley is going to talk about, where folks are really trying to make these macro to micro linkages to some extent to try to identify the extent to which broader macro level sorts of conditions might to some extent influence individual level attitudes, let's say environmental concern, while also taking to, into account individual level sorts of attributes that are widely recognized and studied as well. And this is actually done in the um, world society tradition that was talked about earlier, the idea that if, you're, if a nation state is more embedded in world society, uh, the environmental world society by a stronger presence of environmental NGOs and so on, does that appear to be associated with a greater increase of environmental concern at the individual level? And the short answer is yes. So this is combining survey data, individual level survey data from surveys conducted in 37 nations using the world values survey data, something that Riley and, and his colleagues have, have used quite a bit. Okay, this is where I'm going to try to channel Sandy Market Pyatt because she's brilliant. 
And she's, uh, hopefully you had an opportunity to read that methods uh, PDF chapter that was circulated and this is in there. And, and, and Sandy is actually um, a, a, a true methodologist. She, she teaches this stuff at the ICPSR workshops at University of Michigan. If you don't know what those are, you should check them out. They're really wonderful uh, courses on specialized methods. So here's an example of a structural equation model using latent variables. So the idea here, how, how, how many of you are familiar with SCM, structural equation modeling? Oh my goodness, okay, almost all of you. So I'll go over this pretty, pretty quickly. So, so the idea here though is we have these latent variables that are these sorts of broader concepts that are unobserved, that are represented by these ovals, I guess. We'll call them ovals or circles. And then we have these variables here that are observed, these observables, right? That are, that are designated here by x1, x2, x3, and x4, whatever they are. And then confirmatory factor analysis is used to see do these observed variables combined provide sort of a good fit for this measure, this broader concept like climate change beliefs, okay? And this is actually you know, a model that she has tested that she has proven to, to work quite well. But the idea here is you can use these observable, we have these broader concepts, right? Some of them are a bit fuzzy, some of them not so much. And we can come up with measurements of these sorts of broader concepts by using these observables to come up with measures for these latent variables to look at something here like climate change uh, actions. Historically, SCM was primarily uh, applied to um, cross-sectional data. In recent years, uh, we've been able to start applying this to longitudinal data as well, which is a really important advance, I think, in terms of what we'll be able to do uh, moving forward. Okay, so yeah, we're just flying all over the place. Okay, so I thought this would be an interesting example to talk about. This, is, uh, this was actually in that, that uh, PDF chapter that I circulated, and this is from Larry Hamilton, who is a brilliant methodologist, sociologist by training, and he's someone who has really pioneered uh, ways of incorporating different kinds of ecological and environmental data with social data and doing some very uh, creative things. And so the, I, what, they, what they did here is they did a study of individuals within New Hampshire. And this is looking at um, annual temperature anomalies data, okay, to see if temperature anomalies, not, well, daily, did I say annual? I meant to say daily. Daily temperature anomalies, if they had any sort of immediate effect in changing people's attitudes and, well, their beliefs in climate change, okay? And it's, very, it's a very interesting study. And so, and Larry is also known for using figures very well, these sorts of figures to present very, findings from very complex analyses. If you look at the analyses behind this, it's really rather sophisticated and very complex. But what, what he and his colleagues found using these techniques that they found that when you look at these temperature an anomalies uh, in right before, you know, and they're, they're, they're daily and a little bit after, you see that depending on whether or not a respondent identifies as self-identifies as Democrat, Republican, or Independent, well, Republicans, temperature, no effect. And regardless, like their attitude doesn't change. It doesn't matter what the weather is. For self-identified uh, Democrats, the attitude doesn't really appear to change either. They're very likely to believe in climate change. But what's interesting for those that are self-identified independents, a very interesting fuzzy category when you talk to folks that study this stuff, <coughs> there appears to be a clear sort of, sort of relationship for those that self-identify as independent. So this is a way of interacting data, really almost in kind of immediate real-time data with, with, with temperature anomalies, with someone's sort of political party identification to see whether or not it has any kind of interaction in terms of their beliefs or not believing in climate change. See, we're pretty diverse in what we study. So this is a study that came out in 2004 in the American Sociological Review. And this is a different kind of, well, it's, it's a kind of environmental justice study done. The unit of analyses are counties. And this was a study that if you, I've learned the history of this, how difficult it was to do this study, talking to the authors, I know them quite well, because they had to obtain data from the Department of Defense to do this. They are involved in a serious legal battle for a long time to obtain these data because what they wanted to look at was, is there a, sort of a spatial relationship between unexploded ordnance and um, Native American reservations. It's a very creative study that they were very dedicated to doing and they didn't give up and it took them a long time to obtain these data 
And so they're able to obtain data on the location of an exploded ordnance. And if you don't know what that is, we're talking about bombs, shells, grenades, landmines, et cetera, things that haven't blown up that are, tend to be on different sorts of military bases around the US. And so it's a county level analysis, and these are counts of sites with extremely dangerous sites and less dangerous sites. So this is using negative binomial regression and looking at these sorts of factors here. And the punchline is, is they find that there is a statistically significant relationship between areas, the, the, the amount of Native American land within a um, county and the number of extremely dangerous sites that could not be explained away by other factors thrown into the model, including a whole lot of fixed effects for those of you that are into the fixed effects models. So a different kind of rigorous, creative environmental justice study done at the county level.